Um, okay, I'll just go ahead and screen share. Um, okay, so, um, you know, I joined this book club because of, you know, I think as many of us, like we're trying to bump up our own skills for like our use cases. And this is not really my use case. And in fact, the rest of the book is not really my use case. So, I mean, I think it's good to learn all this. And um, like Derek and I were talking at the very beginning, uh, you know, that one student who, um, who's like a software engineer type might ask me a question here and there. And so it's always good to, to know all these things, but, but anyway, so I'm going to probably ask more questions than, um, than give you answers. Uh, but anyway, okay. So let's, let's just get started. Okay. Um, so we're talking about this structure, this S3 thing. And, um, and it's interesting to me because <laughs> I thought S3, before doing this chapter, I thought S3 meant like, I don't know what I thought it meant, but I thought it meant like basically all of R, like all of R was written in S3 or something like that. But what I've come to learn is that, well, okay. And again, I hope that there's like some discussion here so that we can make sure that all these ideas are clarified and correct in my own brain. But what I, my current understanding is that S3 means a specific type of function that will work on different classes. And, and that's something that I think many of us are familiar with just naturally, even like from our first few days of using R, like the summary command, right? That summary will work on numerical data or data frames or even like a linear model or whatever. So, so it's that power of writing a function that will sort of work um, across many, many different types of objects. So far, so good. I'm looking at Olivier to make sure I'm okay. So, um, so there's this idea of a generic function and, um, and it has, you know, this implementation for a specific class. Okay. Um, so classes are not, um, well-defined in R, um, and you can just define your own class, whatever you want. Um, and so, um, you, uh, you just write an object and you use the structure of the object and you say you want to give the object some random class. And then after that, the object will have that class. Um, and so what that means is that when you apply a function like summary or print or, you know, any of those other generic functions that it'll try to use like the print dot my class version of that generic function. Okay. Um, so then there's some, some nuanced details here about, um, the fact that, you know, when you use summary, um, on an LM, on a linear model object, the, the sort of the internal function becomes summary dot LM. So it takes the generic function and uses a dot and appends the class, right? Summary dot LM, uh, which means that it's good. It's a good idea to not have a period in the um, in either the function name or the um, uh, class name because then you get confused about what it is. And and there's some I don't even know it's in here, but there's some uh, examples of that with like data frame because data dot frame is a class. And so then you're like as dot data dot frame dot data dot frame. Um, definitely gets confusing about which is the class and which is the generic function and, and stuff like that. Um, so, right. So, so having the classes have underscores and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, um, I'm try to... okay. <laughs> um, okay. So there's these three things, um, that, um, help us compose a class. Um, so like we said up here, you could just you could just make it my class, but that wouldn't necessarily um, be useful because none of the generic functions um, would work on, on that. Um, okay, so, um, you know, here we are already at something that I wasn't like 100% sure of. Um, I think what this is doing is it's taking um, an object um, that, well, I don't really... I, Okay, I'd love some help walking through this because 
to me, diff time is already a class. So this is new diff time, which is um, which is a new class. So we're creating this new class using this function. And we have to have an input, which is a numeric value. Um, and then we're forcing it to have a particular type of, of units. So whereas diff time is um, can have you know any of these object, any of these um, units, we're sort of forcing it. Um, so is that is that right that we're just forcing a particular type of units from a diff time object? Yeah, I think it's just like a toy example for like that. So you do 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 not be bothered too much. Like you could have used factor instead and uh, reframe. Like let's say you could have make new factors and instead having factors ordered like by some let's say A B C all the time order. You could have make a new factors and instead of having them ordered by the alphabetical order or whatever the ordering was, it could have been reversed. It's just a toy example. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so this is how how one creates, um, you know. A, a new object and we've got that same kind of structure here, right? So we so we input anything that's numeric and then all of a sudden it comes out and it's now a diff time object with a particular type of units. Okay, sorry, it's... I, um... Okay, now I'm slightly confused because it's yeah. class is gonna be diff time. It's class is not gonna be new diff time. Oh yeah, yeah. it's class is gonna be diff time, right, 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 right. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, so so right, so we've got these three things. We've got like constructing the object um, of the target class, and then we've got this idea of validating it, and then we've got this helper idea, and and I have some confusion around helper also. But okay, so we we may or may not, um, you know, want to check certain things. Um, so um, so in this example, it's like Olivier said, it's it's new factor instead of new diff time. Um, and so it's um, it's it's a way to check and um, oh sorry this isn't the validator yet okay sorry this isn't the validator yeah it's just like using that sort of um, again um, constructor function and checking whether or not uh, you know you have sort of the the input that you think you have okay so. Um, the it doesn't work because you don't have enough levels for the object that you're creating. So you have this object one through five, and you want to make it into a factor variable, but you didn't provide enough levels. And the error message was not sufficient. The error message just didn't give you any information. So what we do instead is we create this um, validator, which is a new function, and helps us understand what's going on. So, um, you know, there's different things that can happen. So, um, you know, one thing that might happen is that um, the, the values must be non-missing and greater than zero, or you have to have at least as many character strings, you know, like levels of your factor variable um, that you have in X. And so now you get, um, you get more informative um, and and user facing errors. So these validator functions are particularly important if you're um, creating new classes that are going to be used by people, as opposed to a new class that's just something kind of in your internals. Um, and so when you give the same uh, one through five, and then quote a as your levels, it says there must be at least as many levels as possible values next. Okay. So that was the previous person who created these slides. And now this is this is me. And so this is a question to you all that I don't really understand. Um, I don't really understand uh, this argument. And I don't know if it's a typo or not. So this argument says that the length of the levels has to be smaller than the largest value. Okay, so this this example came straight from the um from the text, right? So this is just copied directly from the text. So this is me. So so I say, do the integers of this function, and again, I know it's a toy example, but just trying to process what's happening here. Um, do the integers need to start at one and be consecutive? So if not, then 
it should be like that the length of the levels less than the length of the values. And here's the example that I gave. So, so if we tried to make one through three into this, you know, with the levels A, B, C, we get it correct. But if we try to take 10 through 12 as your object, then it says there must be at least as many levels as possible values in X. But you can see that 10, 11, and 12, there's three, three um, values that I'm yeah, trying to make into a factor. No? So go ahead. It should be standardized. A way to solve that should be like standardize it in some way, like uh, make it like, uh, uh, yeah, normalize or standardize it. It works in this toy example, but uh, you correct, like it shouldn't work that way. It should work like uh, it should uh, lower like by the minimums. So we get the same. Uh... Well, well, do they have to be like, what is it about a factor that makes like, I guess my question maybe is this original function, and I didn't look into the factor function. Like it says that X has to be integers, hmm. but does it have to be consecutive integers that start at one? No, it, I mean- Yes, yeah, no. Cause like that's the, that's the internal oh. representation of the, of the factors. Yeah. So the levels can, can be anything, but the internal representation must be like integers starting from one to the number of levels that you have. Yeah. So and it's probably similar with where the... values is defined because values is defined using unclass. So it breaks it breaks the actual true value. It's where it's a little bit tricky. If you scroll up a little bit. You'll see right there the second line under the validate values is uh, you're you're uh, you're breaking the class oh, so that you're getting class, the yeah. underlying integers. There is that that's kind of my my understanding. So that's why it yeah. should break it from whatever. It's not now. It's you know in the example it is one through five, but let's say the example were ten through fifteen or ten. It should break the ten through fifteen, and now it should be individual level numbers, which are integers one through however many there are in which case you can the shortcut is you can just use the max value there instead of the length but it doesn't work it doesn't yeah no, cuz cuz there is no there is no way uh to do it in in the example maybe that will be uh something to put on the helper to kind of switch the the integer that you're receiving as a uh, as the first argument to uh, one to some number. Yeah. I see. So you you would take as input 10 through 12 and you would like map those to the integers one through three. If Yes, if you wanna kind of like give your user that, uh, that possibility. Mm -hmm. If no, you can just like throw the error as as it is. I guess. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to find an example of phase R factor, but I don't uh, have an idea right now <laughs> uh, of any uh, any of them. Um, but uh, I think, uh, in my understanding, is Je Jeffrey is correct. Like the underlying representation of a factor is one, two, three, four, five usually. And that's maybe in the constructor that should uh, enforce that. And then like the user see it as ABC, like inside, let's say like you have like, the oh, I, I assume Iris, like the data set Iris or Palmer Penguin maybe at the beginning were encoded as the factors, like, you know, like the other, the, the species of the penguin and, and, and you read it as Ad Adeli, but in fact, it's maybe one, two or three uh, behind it. So this is like the, the factor that I type override the it's just an integers like if you I, I don't know like if you do some in class you're just gonna get an integers, but uh, I do not know how it's built so we should spend some time um US school grade yeah it's a good example Derek I think so too yeah but I don't know like if we have like an easy data set so we can just look at it quickly <laughs> without like building our own data sets um uh but that that's a good question that we we should maybe we can keep it on slack my understanding is factors uh usually start by one and it's how it's built but maybe like it's because like our new factors is not well enough put 
you build and it does not check what you 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 validate right now mm-hmm. what what one 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 thing i like with the validators is it's it's not only like for the users it's also for the developers let's say like you are building your own class which i have no idea which i will need but i could see myself build on asking people some package like you know i can ask them like hey i really like that that class but i does not have a method for that can we do something and um I really like this validate because like it simplify. I think it will simplify a bunch of codes because like you can introduce in all your futures method, like just check what my input is. And if not, it's just one function instead of having the stop if not and stuff like that. So I think it's, it's nice. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to. You found I something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I'm. I'm gonna post something uh on the on the chat. If if we create a factor with like numbers ten to twenty, and we unclass it, so like the 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 integer that get assigned to that factor start at one. So I mean, this is a, a, the 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 book. It's a, a like a toy example, and as the book said. In the constructor, you should only uh, validate the the types of of the argument that you have. So it's probably in the helper to to create a factor that that you make that that the, the internal implementation make makes that shift to one to to eleven. But okay, so what what happens when you type max unclass x? Because it seems to me that like what you did unclass is what happens in this in this line here, right? And so you do have the numbers one through eleven or whatever. But then I guess I don't think that that. Yes, it's yeah, it's eleven. So why do you think this doesn't work? Because the constructor that, is bad. Because why? Sorry, I don't understand. The constructors should uh, uh, build the level of factor starting to one. The validator is fine, but the constructor should be dif- built differently. Oh, this one? Yeah. So it this one doesn't have an unclass. Uh, X. It just, I mean, being an integer is fine, but then it should, the X should be like- um, Unclass X. That will be, no, it, it need to be, uh, let's say like you provide 10 to 12, it should minus 10. I mean, you should use the minimum to minus- um, Why shouldn't you just unclass it? Because if you unclass it, then you get what Diana did. The, if you unclass the factors, but, but yeah, you're just providing- if I am class 10 to 12, I will get uh, 10 to 12 still. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. Let's try. Um... It just, that, that, that constructor yeah. be kind of the, the internal constructor of a factor. The one that, that is showing in the, in the text. Mm-hmm. Okay. We almost never create a factor. Uh, uh, yeah, we never create a factor like saying the integers and yeah, the integers and the levels you just created with mm-hmm. whatever you want to and, and the levels. Mm-hmm. So yes, that would be kind of the, the internal implementation of the constructor of of, of a factor. Mm-hmm. And then you have the helper. Okay, so let's go to helpers. <laughs> good, good transition there. Okay, so so I have some um I, I think I mostly get what they're doing, but this first thing really confuses me. Okay. For the following reason. So, so, you know, one of the first sort of rules, although none of this is, you know, actual rules, cause you can do whatever you want, but you know, what Hadley says is that they should have the same name as the class. So, you know, in the, in the one we did up here, um, it would be, uh, is it factor or new factor? I guess it would just be factor, right? Because it's validate underscore factor. So it would be called factor. And in the one below that we're gonna, I'm gonna walk us through, it would be called Roman. And the reason I don't understand this is because in my head, it's like we have a constructor and then a validator and then a helper. And so why isn't the constructor 
the thing that has like the name of the thing because that's what I'm constructing. So I don't know, maybe we can come back to that after we go through the example a little bit. But but that really, um, I, I, I had some trouble I, with that. I go think, it, yeah, go ahead, yeah, then if you want to say something. No, you go, go. Uh, my understanding is like Adelaide does not want the constructor to be exposed to the users. So mm. it's not exposed in the namespace of the package. It's an internal function. That's and you only expose the user to the helper function. Uh huh. Okay. That's because, a decision strategy. I feel no. Yeah. And and the the book said that the helper like at the end will call the constructor and the validator. So when right. we're when we're creating a a factor, we're actually calling the helper, not the constructor. Yeah. The yeah. helper will call the the internal and the helper will, will do all this thing that, that we, uh, that, yeah, all this thing that it needs to do to actually make a valid, like a valid object. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense if you understand that into like it's Adlet opinion version of S3, opinionated version. You know, I'm not saying like, obviously his opinion is better than mine, like uh, <laughs> <laughs> without any kind of dub, but mm -hmm. uh, it just like, uh, from the his experience, this is a way like uh, you organize. Yeah. Because there is no organization, you organize your codes in a more clean way. Yeah. And clean is definitely like an opinion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, but at least there's a reason there. I mean, I knew there must be a reason. I just didn't really fully understand it. Um, and and Jeffrey, I, I appreciate that um, uh, quote from the text or whatever. Okay. So, right, like as we've just discussed then, the idea of the helper is to be the front facing, um, you know, user function. And that function is going to call both the constructor and the validator. Um, and so, um, and so I thought we would go through, there's an example in the book, um, uh, which I, I didn't know and is so awesome, like that you can just make, I mean, of course, it doesn't surprise me that somebody wrote a function to form Roman numerals, but it's really, really cool. Okay, so um, so this is the exercise, uh, and it just kind of helped me a little bit put some of these things together. So I thought we could go through it. So, um, okay, the question is, you know, how would you write a constructor, and does it need a validator? Okay, so the constructor is is just like like you're finding this new class, but you're not really creating a new class because you're just using this old class because there is a class already called Roman. Um, at least I think, yeah, as dot Roman, yeah. yeah, it just, right. It already exists. Right. I, yes, think? I think. So. Okay. Okay. Um, and then you read in the documentation, um, that the values, um, are uniquely represented. Um, and so, sorry, the only values between one and, um, 3,899 are uniquely represented. I don't really understand what that means. I guess there are no like higher level M's and stuff like that. Um, that's cool. Um, okay. So, you know, you write this sort of um, validation that, you know, it doesn't work if you have numbers outside of this bound and, and whatnot. And then you get, um, the beauty of zoom and the terribleness of zoom let's see okay there i'll put you guys on the side um uh and that you know if you do this then um uh then you get these errors that you've specified in the um in the uh, uh validation function and and this is the key right here is that the helper basically just is the concatenation of the validation and the construction. So yep. that took me a while to wrap my head around. Okay. Um, so um, this particular chapter was a lot about this function called use method. Um, and um, 
And so now I have a new set of questions. Okay, so my new set of questions has to do with the double arrow versus the single. Well, okay, I guess we're not quite there yet. Okay, so um, okay. Now I'm not really remembering what this. Oh wait, is the next one? No. Okay, sorry. There's there's two functions. There's use method and maybe use something else. Is this okay? Sorry. Um, is there one like coming up? Hold is on. New method. There was one that like fixed next method. That's what I was next. thinking. Okay, okay, okay. So that's what. Sorry, let me. Okay, so this is different. So um, I don't I don't really remember what this does. This just creates a, a an object that is. Pass the arguments from the generic. Like it creates a new generic function that's called new generic. So let's say like my new generic is just um, uh, I don't know what it could do. Uh, uh, a generic should be summary, but you, let's call it fancy summary. Sometimes you want fancy summary to do something on summary, but not not that fancy summary. I don't know. You want it to report like some summary statistics that are not reported in summary. Okay. So you create fancy summary and you want it to be a generic that's going to like when you type fancy summary, if you put it a vectors or data frame or list, it's it going to provide you new fancy summary. Okay. The fancy summary is a generic here. That's going to just use method, and then you're going to write a bunch of um, specific oh. uh, method okay. for like a fancy, uh, fancy summary dot uh, vectors, fancy summary dot uh, data frame, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm okay. lost all the time in which one is the generic, which one is the method. Like, yeah. Yes, <laughs> I, I agree. Okay. So, right. Okay. So we have this fancy summary and yep. we want it to be, it's going to be like print or, or summary or whatever plot. Um, but then you have to make sure that it works for the dot everything's. Um, okay. So, um, so I'm just, okay. So this I thought was really cool. So, um, there's a couple of functions in, um, in this sloop package that will tell us what those um, relationships are, right? So we have a generic function mean, um, and it'll tell us that you can take a mean of all of these types of objects. Um, so, so that's pretty cool if you're trying to figure out, you know, for, for your new function or for, um, you know, a function that you're using a lot, like what types of objects will work on it. And then similarly for a class, we have this idea of, okay, I have um, an object which is ordered, what types of generic functions exist for that class? Um, so that I thought was pretty cool. Okay, so, um, so, uh, oh yeah, okay, it's the next one that I'm worried about the arrows. Okay, so I, I thought um, also it would be good for us to walk through this particular example. I thought this example was was cool. So um, it, the the question in the text is read through the documentation for use method and explain why the following code returns the results um, that it does and and um, what what does it violate? Um, and so um, again, I may need a little bit of help, but I, I think I can understand what's sort of going on here. But I'm not sure I I know what it's violating. So. Um, you write this function g, um, and um, and the function uh, just um, you know defines x as ten and y as ten. And again, I'm not totally sure what use method is doing, um, but then you can define um, these like you know sub functions, right? So g dot default or g dot data frame or g dot ordered or whatever. So g dot default is going to be the main function, um, and it's going to take um, the the values and basically just return. So this is just a return statement, right? That that it says, okay, what is x and what is y? And so when we create two objects in our global environment. So X and Y now both get the values of one. Um, we run G of X um, that 
it is taking the X as the input um, from, from your global environment um, here, um, but it's taking the Y from um, the function G. And then when you run G default, um, it uses both of the objects from the global environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the call stack is a bit complicated. I would like to be able to follow it, but like let's let's say like you are calling. Uh, you want G me to put X. this into into R so you can no, see? No, no. Like the just I I understand why they do it, but like okay, you're calling G. G is calling use method. Then use method. It's gonna reference like the class you have you 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 you, yeah, you didn't define, so it's good for G default. Okay. Then if G if if G default uh, fell, you're gonna have like a, an error on G default that maybe escalate later. But like yeah, you need yeah, that's it. The use method and by the way, I didn't understand like Adlet tried to explain us at the end of the chapters on the technical detail. And he was saying like, basically like, yeah, it's complicated. Right. To add like a pseudo vector that it's gonna match. Uh, and he didn't go too much except like, yeah, at one time he created vectors with all the class and it's kind of loop. That was my understanding on the class going for the first while. But uh, he didn't go into detail. So, but yeah, oh. I don't know. That does uh, also have understood a bit how it worked, but the dispatch method. I don't, I, don't. I, I have a question uh, right there. So if you only define the G dot default method, your generic, it's that will be the only option that your your generic has. Yep. Uh, so there will be no G dot uh, integer integer or D dot. So it's only gonna be G dot default. Yeah. And the binding between G dot uh, integer or G dot numeric, you don't have to specify it like explicitly. It just like R will know which uh, method to call according to the uh, to the type of the argument of the generic. Yes. That's my, my understanding. It's it's going the the class attribute as an order. For example, if you ask a table what the class is, it's gonna start by table then data frame. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is when you and you have a bunch of methods that use table, like for example the print method, you probably have a print table that's do this nice printing. Uh and uh my understanding when you use method like print, it's gonna check the first one by the order inside of the class. So the class attribute like as a, it's the vectors of um, string and it's go for the first. And if it can't go for the first for some reason, it go to the second. But I do not understand exactly how it does that. Yeah, and I do wish there was a clearer explanation of that in the chapter. But it's not, no, I didn't find it, no. Or I was like lost <laughs> in my understanding. Yeah. Or, or even just the, yeah, just a little bit more in the internal workings of what the heck use method does. And like, cause he talked about it as black magic, but it, going a little bit more into depth than calling it black magic and making it <laughs> like a little more explicit about how, about how that works would, would have been, would have been really useful. Right. Cause there, cause it could be the case that you have some function that some, uh, some generic that you apply to tibble to a tibble um, but there's not a, you know, function dot tibble method for tibble. So then it should go assuming, presume, assuming that there's a function dot data frame method, then it would go mm. to use the, use the data frame and apply that method then to your tibble, right? That's, I, that, that's kind of my understanding of how it works, but it wasn't, it's like a lot of inference on my part rather than kind of explicitly drawing that out in the text. Yeah, I agree. Well, so wait, so based on what you just said, Jeffrey, uh, I'm going to walk through this one more time because I'm not sure. So g.default feels like, okay, this is just any old function and I run it and it makes sense to me. But this one right here, it feels like, okay, I put in x equals one 
And then I put in X equals one here. And, and then it's like, I try to write over that value, but like, am, is it because of that layering thing? It's like, no, I'm using this function, which has an identity to X, which is why that X equals one. Uh, it's it's why the trouble here, no? This is why it'd be super useful to have the call stack to see. Yeah. So it, it really like I, yeah, I really don't understand exactly what's going on here because it seems like it's not running. Is it not using? It's not using the g dot default, right? Well, it sort so, of is because in the g dot default, the x is the identity, right? You whatever yeah, you no, plug in true. here, right. you get this. Yeah, right, yeah. which is that that value of one. Yeah, so yeah, it's like yeah. using the method right. of G for the for X the value, X, but but not for the Y. So, sort the, of the, the top function is defining X then ten. Yeah, I'm lost also. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. the one. So I when you explicitly call G default, it uses it uses the X and Ys in the global environment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But if you but if you're just calling G, it only uses the one that's in that's used as an argument in it. Maybe is this where you need the force? Is this where force comes well, in? Maybe. I, 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 I never fully understood force. It'd be interesting to see if as you define the G default, if you if you added a force X mm -hmm. and a force Y, if would that change? Yeah, I don't know. We don't have to do that now, but Anyway, but yeah, so trying to get, so some, but okay, okay. So let me say this then is how I'm understanding this now from reading it and then having this conversation is that somehow this use method creates a link between these two functions that I don't fully understand, but that's sort of the idea is that you're, you're connecting the base function of G with the, um, with the, the, the different methods, the base generic of G with those different, um, classes i guess yeah i think the use method g that's where it's basically saying now go find the class of this object mm -hmm. and then go look to see if there's a method associated with that class yeah and then use that now and so it's just like a go-to statement kind of yeah. an if, if then state or you know a case win it's basically a giant yeah. case because i think this was the kind of whole point of the generics is it gets away from the if thens and the case wins for something oh my like gosh this. you totally just figured it out jeffrey okay you totally yeah. that's exactly what's happening okay so let me try to repeat that so um, it's saying use the use the function, go and figure out the class and, and find out, is there a function that tells me what to do when I have that class? Okay, so I do, da, 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 here I do. Okay, here is my function that I'm gonna use because of the class that I have, and it's just the default one. Okay, what is that function? That function takes an X value and it does these two things. Where is it getting the X value? It's getting the X value from the input in the, in the argument of the function, because this um, framing is exactly connected to this framing. Those two are like, you know, pals. And for anything else, look in my environment, right? And this is back to chapter three. What is my environment here? It's y equals 10. But what is my environment here? It's the global environment. Yep. Look at that teamwork. And and if you do if you call G without defining the default, uh, you get an error message. Say oh, that again. If you call G without defining the G default, like if you just create G without the, with the use method G without defining G default, uh, I get uh, like the error I put chat error in use method G. No applicable method for G because I have not defined it. Right. There's no functions. Yep. As I no said, methods for it to choose from. Yeah. And in this, any and space, then, I have right And now. then the default is just like in case when also, where it's going to try all the other things first. And if it can't find it, then it'll just apply the default and hope that it works. So that should be like the super generic version of the, me of yeah. the method. And let me, let me, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dana. Uh, uh, I was going to ask if you messed up in the, in the, method name like you put g dot integer and you misspell integer you're like you're done you're not gonna have uh, a method for the integer class yeah okay 
Um, can I just clarify one thing? This is my understanding. So I could write a function G and have it be just a ginormous function. And it would say, if the class of the argument is integer, do this. If the class of the object is a tibble, do this. And that the generics dot class construction is a way to break down that generic, uh, that ginormous function into yep. smaller functions. That's that's all we're doing here, right? Yep. Yeah, because nice. you can test and debug exactly those individual More. those individual mm -hmm. things way easier if they're separate functions. So this allows you to generate separate functions instead it, of the giant. If the it's also less of a burden on the user, no? Yeah. Well, it's 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 also tricky uh, potentially because the um, arguments could be very different for these different functions, oh, right? Really? And so and so that to me is where it's hard to write one general function that allows for all of the possible arguments for all of your methods. Yeah. So the, yeah. The, this this super different. Yeah, exactly. Summary on LM versus summary on a data frame, you know? Yeah. Okay. Okay, there was nothing really in object styles. Um, okay, so um, okay, so here um, uh, I would love some help on um, these arrows. Okay, so um, uh, class, and we've sort of referred to this a little bit, the fact that we have tibbles and data frames and stuff like that. So you could have like different classes um, and that they're, um, so, so if you ask about the class of this object, which is ordered X or whatever, um, then, um, okay. Um, uh, and that you go through the classes until you find the one, until you find, um, like if you wanna print, right? Then you're like, okay, should I, is there something called print.ordered? Is there something called print.factored? Is there something called print.default? Right. So you walk through them until you find the one that, you know, works for you. Okay. So, um, so now we have something um, where we're trying to figure out the, the square bracket. And I don't understand the difference between the double arrow and the single arrow. The double arrow is where you start, I think. Um, this is, by the way, a representation. No, so you are, we are calling all the red um, on X, but um, on this case, I think um, we also ask at next method, so it's going factors. It's my understanding. I read that this morning. But... <laughs> Okay, well, well, maybe we'll go on and come back because I think maybe the other examples are make this a little bit easier. Okay, so um, so we're creating a Wait, new class. Okay, can go can ahead, I ask yeah. one one question uh, on the on the first example? So it says like if we're calling it with order and the double error, it's the method that it's called. Then why isn't it print order? Because I think it's this copy example, like we use the next method already. That's why it target factors. There's just okay. like in the, it's the the notes are a shortcut in the book. You, it's go a bit slower. Okay. This, I'm not sure I fully understand, but let's let's go on to the next example, and then we can come back to this one. I think that might help. Yeah, okay. this, my, the secret is good here. Okay. So, um, okay. So we're going to create um, a new class called secret. Um, and um, uh, we're going to, we're going to have a, um, a print method associated with an object called secret. And so um, what this object does is it just prints the um, number of characters um, in the, in the, um, numeric object okay so um in the textbook he ha had an x here but that confused me so i called the object y instead of x um okay so so this seems pretty pretty straightforward um but 
the um the square bracket method is problematic because it doesn't preserve this secret class okay because there's no um there's no dot secret um a uh, uh, um, function i guess you know or there's no square bracket dot secret function and so um so it just uses the internal value which then is 15. so you could fix this um with a dot secret method so you know like just like we would do any anything okay we want to get it right then um then what we do is we uh just write that function I didn't, I didn't evaluate this um, because um, then I wanted to, um, or because Hadley tells us to, it wasn't really me, uh, because the, he says that this next method is more efficient because I think he says, um, well, actually, I don't know. Is it? Yeah, you, you're going to run into a for loop, an, an infinite loop, I think on this one. In here, this one? No, the the one that's asked not run. This one. Yeah. Oh. Because like you are like uh, you are basically like you you get you are like unclassing and then reassigning it and then oh. if you want to sub like let's say like you are like let's say you have uh your new secret x. Yeah, what's the workflow is x? Then you subtract x. I mean the square bracket is a subset. Then you subset uh x for one. What's happening in the function? You unclass it, then you re redo it an X. So, and subset it by one. So mm -hmm. what do you do? Then you unclass it, and then you are, uh -huh. so you go uh -huh. like in some kind of while loop uh, infinite. I think this I'll is have my- I'll though, because I, I think this did run for me. Well, well. But I don't, I'll good. have to go back and check that. <clears throat> um, but anyway, he says, this is what he said. He said, it creates a copy of Y, but that's sort of what you're saying, but I'm not sure no, I that's got after. It then i think um but the and the, the next method is more efficient okay so so yeah. um uh you correct the, the one with unclass is correct there's a, a previous one which you just if you do not unclass you go into a for loop uh, oh, okay. Loop. Okay. Yep. okay 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 sorry my bad no it's all right it's all right so olivia do you want to tell us what's happening in this one then because this one again yeah, this, seems this like is, magic. This one would just like it does it. It's going to uh, an, an an infinite loop because it tried to, uh, not this one. Sorry. No, no, no. This one. Tell me what this one's doing. The correct one. So the the correct one is the good way of like just um, without going to unclass it to uh, use the um, the method that goes directly to inter internal instead of going to the um, to the default version of it. So, so sorry, next method, it, yeah. it, it does what? Can you say one more time? Sorry. It's, it skipped, it skipped, uh, a, I mean, I, I, I understand class attributes as a vectors. So I, I jump one class. I mean, like, it like jump it one down the element of the vectors. Like in this, it's jumping here. Yeah, that's my understanding, but I could be wrong. So, so does that mean it uses the internal one, not the secret one? Uh, yes, that's my understanding. So the single arrow means the one we're going to use. And the double arrow one means the one we could have used? Yeah. The, 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 the one that was called to use. But but oh. we're but we're so that so I think the double arrow is the call, yeah. But this the next method allows you to skip the one that's called to to the to go to the internal so that it will actually because like the 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 square default will work here. It will be able you will be able to subset an integers. Yeah. But you don't want to do that because you lose your 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 proper, your secret property. So what is the bracket internal? Uh, it's a subsetting that it's passed to a C function somewhere. I mean, not maybe not a C function, a C uh -huh. code somewhere. Yeah. Uh huh. And it's just that the object itself is secret. The object itself looks like this. I mean, should look like this. In fact, it's fifteen one in four hundred sixty. But yeah. <laughs> 
Interesting. So that that's my and that's what is, I mean. It's, I can confirm it. It's by three hundred seventeen. The the equal uh, the equal uh, and greaters indicate that the the subsetting secret is called, but that next method delegate work to the underlying internal methods. As the uh, assignments uh, right assignments arrow point, but I. Like what would be a good example? Like admit, like let's say we have like secret, uh, subsetting secret. Then we have another class that's called my big secret. Uh, if next method is passed, do we are gonna go from secret to default or to secret default? To internal? That would be a good validation rules yeah. to, to check that. But yeah. that's yeah, because okay, so now I'm very confused by this. But again, like it's okay because I've learned a lot and I don't really use this, so it's okay. Because now here, this this says like okay, it's problematic because we jumped all the way to internal and we got 15 out of this. Yeah, that's well. And down here, it's like oh, we jumped to internal and we got the right thing. Yeah, that's good. Good points. Why does jumping to? But I don't. No, I don't know. I, I I guess I should experiment with it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the not easy is it's, stuff. It's internal, so like you're, so um, we're, it's opaque to us to see what's happening. Unfortunately, totally. so it's kind of a bad a bad example to use to 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 put a put it down into something where we can no longer see what's happening. So I guess we have yeah. to just trust that the internal version is doing it correctly, but we had oh, to skip over secret. default to get to that maybe. Yeah. Yeah, but I, well, I, I think I would get the XX because then you turn it into new secret. I mean, you, you're using internal, but uh, because there's there's the call oh. to secret, then like you get it right. And it's exactly the same as doing the thing that it's uh, up. Yeah, it's it's exactly the same as that one, but you skip the need to use on class. Oh, that I understand what you said. So basically, like the X is still here, and the internal is gonna still call it instead of copy pasting it. Mm -hmm. Which, to be fair, for clarity's sake, I prefer that version. <laughs> uh, the one when you, uh, even if you create a copy of X, I mean, I understand that like, it make more sense to not copy and modify here, but uh, I mean, not modify. Yeah, it's a copy and modify, but maybe like just like yeah, good. Yeah, I think correct. That, yeah, no, yeah. So here, okay. like you, you are just like still calling X the internal. You you just to to go back directly to calling your secrets without uh, needed the X, which is like here. It's a bad, uh, like on on the what you underline. Like it should be like let's say let's call it Bob. Like function the X and Y, and then you, when you unclass X, it's become Bob, and the new secret is Bob the uh, of Y. Yeah. Uh, Subsetting so yeah. by Y. While uh, on the version with your new secret method, uh, the next method does not copy. You're still using hex. It does not have uh, any uh, like it's arguments. You are just sque skipping a method, but still keeping hex. That's my understanding. And the <laughs> internal I'll supposedly I allow us to do that, but I'm not. Uh... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. Like it's it's kind of obscure. I mean, at my level, at least. <laughs> and my, my level is way obscure. Okay, so I think we're close to the hour. Um, yeah. You know, there's ways of like having my secret secret or super secret, you know, which is like a subclass. Um, and then there was a little bit more. Oh, no, that was it. Oh, okay, so let's go back there just for one second. Um, uh, they didn't went too much into, yeah, into the dispatch detail and uh and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't really go any farther than that. But just kind of, there's, a, a, you know, writing kind of like a, a set of like a, you know, kind of like we have Tibble and Data Frame, right? Those would be like subclasses of one another. So there's a way to do that too. Well, it was good. Thanks. No, it's definitely it's, an odd topic. Um, yeah. I think it's uh, yeah. But it's uh, it's kind of straightforward in the application. I don't know, like I, I'm not planning to create S3 classes, but I have used a lot of S3 classes. Yeah. So it's helped me a lot, like debugging. And sometimes also like, 
For example, I use the package SF a lot. And mm -hmm. the package SF implements uh, multiple uh, S3 classes. You have F SFC, which is for Kellen, SFG, which is for geometry. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also like as a bunch of uh, IDEN function or not necessarily exposed to users. For example, uh, that's that's worth uh, playing around uh, in some time. So uh, that's cool to know and, and a bit understanding. Uh, for example, like you, you can convert, I think like it has an as data frame from an SF object and as it does that is interesting and a lot of stuff like that. So it was good. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I great. Thank you guys for all your help. The VCTRS package. So I don't know if others have experience about it, but I, I have no, so I should check about it. I didn't have time. Yeah, no, I don't know. And thanks. And yeah, S3 is definitely complicated. Uh, Especially because I think in this chapter you have S3, then you have Adla, Adla, Adla Weekend version of S3. And uh, and yes, and I think I have seen a bunch, like for example, one stuff that always bothers me is like this helper or constructor function, like you never know where to find them. Mm -hmm. You need to find the, so it's it's hard to, to, to do, but yeah. Anyway, thanks a lot. All right, well, thank you everybody. Have a great weekend. Yeah, bye. You'll push stop, Olivier, or write what? stop. You write oh, stop. Yes. <laughs> uh, end, I think. <laughs>